And, and another of the social dynamics that I found consistently mentioned by the people I talked to, and one of the ones about which I'm most fascinated, is the way that we routinely get very emotionally, very intimately caught up in these seemingly casual experiences. Um, how genuine and heartfelt emotions can rise up even with people who are technically strangers. Right? People who you will never meet in face-to-face -face space. All of a sudden you feel a real connection to them. Maybe even a sense of um, interpersonal support. Like you want to help them. Like they want to help you. I mean, I'm thinking about the message boards and blogs where people are really you know, spending hours giving one another information. Uh, based upon nothing more than the fact that they have the same disease. Well, you know what? That's a big deal to have the same disease as somebody else. And to be able to connect with that person when previously you might not have, again, that's doing something very humane, right? Very important to us psychologically. Um, and it, because it's portable, it can happen anytime, day or night. So any time of the day or night, you're able to reach out to somebody who, you know, you might never have met. And now you really feel that you're meeting them. And the people I talked to told me there is a sense of absolutely feeling like you know this person as well as somebody you might know face to face, somebody who might live next door to you, somebody you might run into um, you know, in the, in the physical world. And that you can absolutely become friends with these people. It's unexpected. It can be surprising. It can become romantic. It can become uh, you know, life-changing. It can have, and I'm going to talk about some of the risks and hazards later, because I know it starts out, I talk about all this like great stuff about community, and I never want people to think that there's no hazards to all this. There's hazards to any kind of community. All kind of social relationship has its risk. So none of this is all rosy and perfect. But it, it's still surprising, especially to people who have been studying this for many years and expected technology to separate us from one another more than it, more than it does. I mean, people really told me over and over they used the, the terminology that being online gave them a rush, just a feeling like a giddy kind of sensation, like being on a date or something. Uh, one person told me, I usually am excited when I'm online. Again, that doesn't seem to go together with the idea of being in a hangout, but that's what makes the experience so rich, so complex, that it's not just one thing or the other. Um, a, a little bit of a longer quote I like from someone. Someone said to me, one time I met a guy from Scotland online. We talked about our favorite books and everything under the sun. It was crazy. It gave us a connection we couldn't have ever had otherwise. I felt giddy like I was going on a date or something. It was surreal. Now this giddy, indeed surreal sensation is not uncommon online. It represents you know, a, a large portion of the feeling that goes on underneath these connections. And to me, it's really representative of just the power and vitality of human association itself, of sociability, you know, of why we're trying to get together with other people, to feel that jolt, right? To feel that uh, rush. And it turns out that online, even if you don't have contact, or if, well, you'll have some kind of contact, but even if you don't have a physical picture of the person, even if you don't have video, um, even if it's all being done mostly through text, you can still develop a very strong relationship. Research has shown that physicality can sometimes detract from a relationship. It can detract from the essence of a relationship. That social attraction and involvement and even closeness can actually be enhanced when people don't have the means to touch or see one another. Um, sounds a little strange, but stay with me. Uh, one of the people I interviewed told me about someone she initially met online, who she ended up having a relationship with, romantic. Um, it became where they wanted to take it offline because it became that strong. But she said she thought it ended up being much stronger that they met first the way that they did. Because she said, and I quote, he got to know my insides before he knew my outsides. And people said, you know, what's really more important? What's going on inside? And, and when you're meeting in that way, you don't have to concern yourself with being evaluated and judged on your physical attributes, right? You might feel more comfortable to open yourself up to another person more easily. And of course, this is all really amazing for people who, for some reason, are forced to be housebound, or they're sick, 
or they're disabled, or they're aged, or maybe they're just shy, and they're not going to have the facility to make the face-to-face -face relationship as easily. And they get to do all that unfolding online first. And it can become, you know, again, something that really enhances a relationship, creates a relationship. People told me of a sense of relief to be able to go to one of these communities at a portable, in a portable way, anytime, anywhere. One person said, going online or texting always makes me feel better if I'm sad, if I want to talk to someone or I need support. Someone else said, it allows me to feel better about myself, in part just because helping others always feels good. It's the best way to ease grief or loneliness. And online, you've got a million opportunities to help somebody. There's, you know, there's, there's blogs, there's websites, there's message boards, there's your friends on Facebook, somebody needing something, and you being able to help someone to offer some kind of support, some kind of social capital to them, is, uh, it's a connecting thing, but it's also something that raises your feeling of well-being. So again, something that can almost restore that pre-tribal kind of frequent, constant contact in which people are helping one another out so often. And as somebody put it to me, it doesn't matter what time of the day or night, someone's always online. I don't feel like I have to disturb somebody by calling. The convenience really plays into this as well. And yeah, these interactions are very, you know, they're very controlled. They're very well managed. They're, we can edit them, right? We can edit our Facebook posts as many times as we want before we post it. It's not like speaking off the cuff and it maybe doesn't have that kind of risk. Um, many sociologists argue that face-to-face -face relationships have that kind of component, though, still. That in the face-to-face -face world, we're still kind of editing ourselves. We're trying to put our best face forward. A guy named Irving Goffman called this impression management, that we're managing our impressions as we go through the world. We're, you know, we're always doing some aspect of that face-to-face -face anyway. So again, the online is really not that different. It just sort of reveals the way people are, the way people have always been. Um, and then again, there's just something to knowing that your friends, or at least some subset of your friends, is always technologically available. And that becomes something that you can control. Instead of going through the world, you know, feeling very alone or feeling like, you know, I'm too busy and I'm cut off, you're feeling plugged in. And you can, you can get into and bow out of interactions a little bit more easily online. So it becomes a valuable and I would argue now an indispensable way of connecting in the modern world. Right? You can hardly do without all of this online connecting. Um, we're forming and shaping our identities this way, absolutely, right? We're using Facebook and Twitter to shape and to document who we are as a person. And we're also we're changing our experiences and ourselves in anticipation of this. You know, I mean, just, you know, we're, we're photographing everything and putting it all online. But knowing that we're going to photograph something means that maybe we're acting a little differently than if we're never going to photograph it. Um, there are people who use the Facebook apps like Spotify and Storify, and they're going to be, um, or, or the one, the reader apps, which tell everybody about what you're reading. Um, but now you're probably going to shape what you're reading and what you're listening to so that you know that when everybody sees it, they see an aspect of you that you want to communicate. So you're, you're shaping and changing your identity in response to the fact that you know you're going to put it out there publicly. But many sociologists say we've always kind of done that anyway. This just makes it more obvious. Um, it's a complex process. It's multi-layered. Um, our attention spans tend to get very splintered. A sociologist named Linda Stone has called this um, continuous, giving continuous partial attention to things that we don't give total attention to any one thing. We're always kind of continuously paying attention to a bunch of different things. It's kind of like a, an electronic multitasking. A lot of you, I bet, are very, very good at that. Um, it concerns people who are older. And it's a, it's a reasonable concern, because you want to be able to give full attention to something. You want to be able to consider something in depth, not just a tiny little piece of something. However, you know, those of us who are older have to remember that many of you are going to be entering a world, a work world, which is configured very differently than it was in prior generations. And you're going to need that skill. You're going to need to be able to do continuous partial attention to a bunch of tasks at once. That's the way the world's going to be set up. You're going to be good at it, and you're going to be better at it than those of us who are older. Uh, but let me, let me look at the downside of some of this, too. 
because that's only fair, it's only right, and I never give a talk without at least making sure that I've you know, said some of the things that I always want, for example, my teenagers to hear. Um, and that is, of course, you've heard this, but it's very easy to forget in the moment of being online. You feel like you're in this private space. And like I said, because you get so intimately and emotionally involved, you feel like you're making this one-to-one -one connection. You forget that the rest of the world can look in, <coughs> will look in, that this stuff can be archived forever. It really, really can. Um, and I mean, you can just look to the recent Rutgers webcam trial and how all that evidence came out against Arun Ravi because he had tweeted and Facebooked and texted to his friends, things that later in a courtroom people were arguing and deciding what was his intent about those things, you know. And of course he expected all that stuff to be private. We expect everything that we're doing online, that who would ever want to see it? Um, and future employers, future grad schools, parents, all kinds of people can see. It's not really very difficult. Um, as the WikiLeaks presentation was showing us, to, to hack into or to just simply you know, be able to find things online. And uh, you know, Google and Yahoo, they could give up, or Facebook could give up this information anytime they want anyway. Um, timeline, it's very, very easy to go back years and see what you were doing in 2007, and so can your parents, so can your teachers. Um, this stuff is just, it's obviously very, very easy to access. So that's just to keep in mind, right? You know? But we forget, we all forget because we're doing it at the speed of lightning, and we're doing it constantly, and we're doing it, you know, uh, at odd hours, when we're not really being sharp, when we're not really thinking. And you gotta watch those photos that you put up online. You know, everyone can see them, and, and you know, are you gonna still want them up there three or four years from now? Just something to think about. Um, think about the other social problems, too, that are exacerbated by using all this technology in this way. Stuff like identity theft, okay, and you know, harassment and bullying, how that's got new dimensions now. There are threats to civil rights in cyberspace, you know, people having their words used against them, the marketing of pornography to children, the drug trade. There are definite digital divides. There are big gaps in access to this technology and all that it can provide. Yeah, think about how excessive use can bring about dependency, overstimulation, even just a sense of fatigue and depression, you know, when you've been online for too long, how you just don't feel like doing anything else. I mean, you know, that's not great. You know, portable technologies, they're invading, just like they're providing all these great spaces and opportunities for us. They're also invading these spaces. They're everywhere we go. Um, you may be expected to check in with others wherever you go, and you may be giving up some of your privacy, some of your alone time, some of your just ability to be your own private self. You may be giving that up without even thinking about it. Like I said, people knowing everything that you're reading and watching and listening to, you know, you, you may forget that it's sometimes nice not to have that happen. Um, and once it becomes an expectation, it becomes a norm, and everyone does it, everyone will be more likely to continue to do it, and it will be harder to buck the norm. But, you know, there's, a, there's something to be said for it. Because, you see, the lines between work and home and these third spaces, they're being blurred. They're being blurred all the time. So now you can be located any hour of the day. You're going to have a job where your employer may think that you should be able to be located any hour of the day because, because it's technologically possible. And if you've grown up with this and you think that's normal and you think that's fine, you may not think to resist. But resistance is sometimes important. Being on duty all the time really does carry mental strain and drain. It does. Um, and especially if you're younger and you're not thinking to resist and to make a distinction between the home and the work and the third space, if you're like always hanging out in all these spaces simultaneously, I mean, you're really ripe to be, you know, have, have things sold to you at any given moment, you know, and to be, to be thought of as just a consumer and not as a person. And again, I do think this is all about humanity and people connecting, and we don't want to lose that along the way. So these are things to think about. And half of my, of my interviewees told me that they, they try to place limits on how much people can, can reach them and how much uh, they, they f have to feel obligated to be online all the time. But we do see that that is changing year in year, year in and year out, that people are more and more thinking that they have to always be available. And that's, you know, that's a concern.
because disconnecting is important too. And it really does bring about a sense of you know, peacefulness and the ability to reflect on things and the ability to do something in depth that will sometimes still be important to you. And that's something we don't want to lose in terms of our humanity, right? Um, but there's a norm, there's an ever-expanding expectation that we are going to be available to one another. It's widespread, so we're constantly, you know, like asking ourselves, do we want to be, a, do we want to be available? Do we, you know, should we not be available? Are people coming up with excuses all the time if they, if they just want a little time to themselves? Oh, I couldn't find my phone, it ran out of battery power. Uh, my favorite one is I was using it on the toilet and it dropped in, now it's dead. So that they can't, you know, so that they can't be reached, so that they can have a moment to themselves. Um, you know, we're expected to be in touch and we may feel guilty when we're not. But it can also make us feel kind of lost and untethered when we're not together.